are going to talk about Miriam. And um, I, I just want to say, y'all, when I first started this, I definitely didn't think I was going to learn the lesson that I ended up learning. Let me just say that first and foremost. I was um, I was shocked at the, the things that God um, did bring out to me. And even so much so that last night I had to call Pastor and talk to him for a little bit to just kind of get confirmation that um, that it was, I, I felt like I just needed to give so much detail that I needed to find all the facts and that it, it, it was turning more into a history type thing than really what God was wanting it to be because it was, that was what I felt like I needed to do. So I called him and talked with him last night and he was like, look, just tell them what you feel like God's wanting them to know about it. They don't care about all this history and whether Moses had one wife or two wives, was whether it was Zipporah that, you know, that caused her to, her, that she was talking about, whatever. It doesn't matter. That's not the parts that matters. The part that matters is the lesson that God's wanting to teach them through that. So I had like all these pages of notes and stuff that I'd scribbled on and went back over. So I had to kind of condense everything and uh, kind of rein it back in. So um, the name Miriam means prophetess or lady and I thought you know sometimes we don't really think about what the names mean but I thought that was pretty fitting that you know prophetess or lady and then here she turns out to be a mighty lady she leads ladies throughout this time period and and is truly a prophetess of God um she was an older sister of Moses and Aaron she um loved to sing and dance um, which we'll learn later on. Her parents were Amron and Jochebed. Is that how you say that? Jochebed. Jochebed. Um, she was a Levite. She was struck with leprosy. Um, and some people think that she received a hard discipline. But when we start talking about the, the time period when she received the leprosy, I think we're going to see that it wasn't so much as a harsh discipline as it was... A true revelation that there was a purpose why God chose leprosy versus some other you know striking her dead for instance right there um, she never enters the promised land although she left you know with Moses um, during the time um, she arranged she was the one who arranged for her mother to be a wet nurse for Moses when he was you know left in the in the waters <clears throat> and most of us, I don't know about y'all, but my whole life, that's mostly the story I heard mm -hmm. about Miriam. So that's kind of where my extent of knowledge from her was. I didn't even realize until much, much later on that she was the one who was struck with leprosy. I always knew that it was Moses' sister, when you know, but I didn't really, I don't know why, I just didn't correlate the two together, but... Um, she had a life of service and leadership. She was courageous, loyal, smart. Um, she had a way with music and storytelling through dance. Um, and I, I didn't realize this, but um, when I was going back and reading the story, you know, when the, when the decree was issued that all the baby boys be drowned, well, her father, Amron, had separated from her mom. Mm -hmm. And she had had the courage to go to him and say, look, this is wrong. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're cutting out all people, not just boys, because there's girls that are born too. And so she went up against her dad and got him to change and come back right. to her mom. And that's how Moses was conceived and come about. So from the very beginning, at a very, very young age, she was already doing God's work behind the wheels, you know. Just like all these other ladies we've studied about, it started way back in their in their early childhoods. And I think if we look, that's going to be the case with all of us as well, is it starts way back in our early childhoods that we really became servants. Sometimes we didn't even know that we were being a servant. You know, we were not making right choices sometimes, but God was preparing us to be strong enough to deal with the things that was coming. Um, I feel like when I was studying... That water 
was like an important part in her life. There was three main events that centered around water, and water is a symbol of life. So I kind of correlate Miriam with life. She was full of joy and livelihood, and she kept the women upbeat and <coughs> you know, kept them going in times when they really didn't have a whole lot to celebrate. <clears throat> but in Exodus 2, verses 1 through 10, is where she saves her brother from the water. Mm -hmm. So that's the first instance of water. And then in Exodus 15, 20 and 21, that's when she led the song of victory at the Red Sea, you know, once the, all that happened and they were killed. Moses actually taught them the song first, and then she kind of changed it up a little bit, where he was saying, I she just kind of changed the wording slightly. Um, and they led the women with tambourines mm -hmm. in song and dance. So there again was the second part of water. And then the third is in Numbers 21 and 2. I did not realize this until I studied it. After her death, God gave abundant water where she died. He formed a spring. A well, wasn't it? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. A well spring. That's what right. And because that was in essence what her life was. She was full of That's life. Right. She you know, she had this over this just this zealous. And they named the well after her, right? Yeah. 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 That's pretty cool. And I thought, wow, <clears throat> that is just that was, cool that was awesome that mm -hmm. um, you know, you think about okay, so it was a barren place. There was no water there. Mm -hmm. And then when she dies, just, you know, God builds this, uh, this tremendous spring. And I, <laughs> I was closing my eyes when I was reading it the other night, and I was just like, you know, I could just see this. I could just see the spring just bursting out of the ground and just becoming this flowing life. Mm -hmm. And I thought that is so much indicative of how God is in our life if we will let him. He's in a dry place when we keep him pushed down <laughs> and we don't follow his direction and stuff. He's, he's like pushed down and in dry lands. But then when we release ourselves and let him use us and let him live through us, it's like the spring just breaks forth and we can't stop ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can't stop smiling. We can't stop loving on people. We can't stop helping. It's just because it's God's love that comes through out of that. And that, that was just kind of how I felt about Miriam and, and kind of how, you know, God showed us that even in her death, you know, she she still was being great, great. you know, used, used, used by God. Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, in Hazaroth um, was where she and Aaron were troubled about the two matters. And that was the Cushite woman and then Moses' authority over them. And when I started reading about that, um, that's in Numbers 12, 1 through 9, by the way. Um, but, you know, I got hung up on that Cushite woman. <sighs> is it Zipporah? Is it not Zipporah? Is it a second wife? Is it, you it know, is it not though, a second wife? Well, th there's a mixed, some people say it is, some people say it wasn't. Okay. Some people say that Zipporah that we stayed about the other week was one wife and then to Zephora mm -hmm. was a second wife, mm -hmm. which was a Cush, Cushanite, Cush, mm -hmm. Cushanite. Cushanite. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I kept getting hung up on that. And then I realized, so what? What does it matter? You know, maybe Zipporah had died and he just married this woman, you know, and that's how she just came in the picture. Back in that time, though, often men were married to more than one wife. Yeah, they were. So the Bible doesn't explicitly say, so therefore it really doesn't have any importance is what I kind of feel like. I feel like the things that are in the Bible hold importance to God and therefore they should hold importance to us. So if there's not direct um, information that says one way or the other, then it didn't matter. It's not important. It's not, that's really not who she's about. Right. And so I kind of had to let that go and say, okay, God, now what? And then the second part was Moses' authority um, over them. And this is where I really felt like this is really us today. You know, we, we all of us have somebody in authority over us. All of us do. And sometimes we buck that authority. 
Well, guess what? <laughs> that authority comes from God. So when we buck that authority, we're in essence rebellion against God. Mm. Our husband, if he's a Christian man, our husband is supposed to be the head of our household, right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, he's supposed to make the decisions about our household. We are supposed to hold a supporting role to him. Now, I know some of you women out there ain't going to like to hear that, but it's the truth. That's how God intended it to be. It's not saying that we're lesser people. It's not saying that we're a lesser class, but that's how God intended it. He intended man to be here, and he intended woman to be here. We're supposed to be his partner. We're supposed to support him and be there for him. That's hard for us to do in this day and time, is it not? Yes, ma'am. Because everything else in the world no, is coming against it. us saying, well, you're being, you're being ruled by your husband. If you let your husband rule your household, well, you're just, you're just being ruled. Your husband's just overrun. I wouldn't you. say that Joe ruled our household, though. We make decisions pretty much together. But does he have the final know. say? My husband rules mom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. Not very often. <laughs> <laughs> but his sometimes his don't make sense to me, so I'm just like that doesn't make no sense. Why would I do that? I don't, I'm just being transparent. No, not always. Most of the time, he says whatever you say goes. So, <laughs> well, that being said, Wendy, so am I wrong for that? Yes. Am I really? Yes. The man is supposed to be the head of your house. If what he's if, a godly man, mm -hmm. and you believe that he has a godly walk. Mm -hmm. with Christ, I do. then you're supposed to trust his judgment and you're supposed to hold a supporting role. Now, if you see him erring, if there, if he's making a decision that you see, you have all rights to speak up, but you need to speak up to him, not to others. You need to go directly to your husband and say, look, you know, I believe that we need to do it this way because, but he needs to have the final say. He's head of your house. That's the way God intended him to be. See, he always comes for me, and I and everybody else in the family always comes to me too. They yeah. don't, I don't know. I guess because I've always played that role. Well, but, because you have, yeah. So I guess I don't know. I need to back up. I guess. Well, no, you just need to learn to work. Like you said, though, y'all make the decisions most together of time, yeah. most of the time. Mm -hmm. You just need to learn to release the reins when it needs to be released, and and some men honestly don't like that role. You know, That's some men don't like doing... stepping into that. Yeah. And so it, it is easier a lot of times. But he is supposed to be the head of our house, our husband is, and he is supposed to have the final say in um, the final judgment call and stuff. So. Wait till I tell him this when I go home. He's going to say, I love that Bible study. <laughs> I just learned to say yes. Yeah. All right, what about, um, what about on our jobs? If we, if we had a job if we, when we were working out in the secular world, or even in church, mm -hmm. you know, as a secretary or working at the food bank or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's somebody in authority, right? In the church, it's Pastor Tim. That's right. If we have an issue with something Pastor Tim says, we need to go directly to Pastor Tim. Right. We don't need to go to the deacon first or Five out here to people. Sally Sue or right. go to Uncle Joe and say, look, I, what, what was, I don't agree with what he said. No, we need to take it straight to our pastor because he is the one who got that direction from, from the God. Lord, which is the same way Moses did. He got his direction for what they're, you know, talking about this authority that he has over them. That direction came directly from God. That wasn't something Moses asked for. Right. Moses was a very, very humble man. Mm -hmm. And so we just need to understand that Miriam had to learn a hard lesson mm. that God places the authority where he wants the authority to be. And there's, there's one word that Miriam did that we all do today, and we all hate this word. We hate when people call us this. Anybody want to, get, want to take a guess at what the one word she did that started all this? Starts with a G. Gossip. This is one of the first instances of gossip in the Bible. Instead of going to Moses, whom she had watched oh, yeah. over, true, yeah. worked with, trusted, loved, cared for all these years, instead of going directly to Moses, what did she do? She went to Aaron. She goes to Aaron. Well, then her and Aaron talk. 
Well, then the women out in the field hear her and Aaron talking. Right. Well, then they start talking. And you know what gossip is. Once it goes <laughs> to one, it goes to another. And each time it starts to change. It's so, big by the end. end. It's a totally right. different So story. Had, had she went directly to Moses with her issues, I don't think she would have received any punishment. I believe her punishment was because she started gossip. She started gossip about Moses' ability, about his judgment, about his thought process, about how slow he was moving. Whatever it was that she directly said, she started that gossip train that ended up going here, which was going to crash Moses' authority with the people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <clears throat> a lot of times we we think... You know, you can look at this one of two ways. Okay, she went to Aaron, her brother, with concerns about her older brother. So that wasn't really gossip. No, it was gossip, plain and simple. Ain't no way about it. She had a problem with Moses, and rather than going to Moses, she went to the other person. That's exactly what gossip is. When you don't take the issue right to the people, right to the person, you take it to somebody else. Yeah. You then started gossip because then somebody else changes it. And then somebody else changes it, and then somebody. If you just else went to the first person to begin with, it wouldn't be that big old. You thing. might have gotten a revelation from, from God, right. and then right. you, and then the people that you go to start to lose the trust in the person that you had the issue with to begin yeah, with. That's, that's right. Because they see if you don't trust them, or if you're having an issue with them, and it may be innocent, right? But they see you have an issue with it. You've just then, totally burned yeah. those bridges. Yes, yeah. I absolutely true. agree. Well, when Moses <clears throat> killed the Egyptian, he was about 40, which would have put Miriam somewhere around 50, 55, maybe, somewhere along in there. And then they didn't meet again for 40 years. So during those 40 years, you know, the first 40, you know, when he's three months old, he, she takes him down to the river and then gets the nursemaid, and then he lives with them till he's old enough to go to Pharaoh's palace. So then she's left in slavery, with her parents, he's living in the palace, okay? Then, you know, he, he kills the Egyptian, he, he runs off, he's gone, they don't see each other for 40 years, and during that time is when he marries Sephora and has the two sons, and then he gets the message from the burning bush that he needs to go back. Mm -hmm. So it's been another 40 years, okay? So he goes back to Egypt, and this is when all this starts. Well, what does Miriam feel during this time? You know, is she thinking, God, I misread you because, you know, she she had prophesied that he was going to be great mm -hmm. before that he was, you know, she believed that he was going to save their people. So how did she react during this time, you think? Do you think she ever lost faith? Do you think she... Yeah. She probably felt jealous like that. I was that thinking the same thing. He was thing. getting to live the, I guess you would say, the high life. life. Yeah, and then here she is stuck in slavery, and she's just like, "Well, that's not what I see." That's thought. that was kind of what my first thinking was, but then as I read through, I don't think that I don't think she had that in her at that point in time. You don't think she had jealousy mm -mm. in her? I don't think she had jealousy in her at that time. I think she she believed that she had received a message from God when Moses was conceived. Mm -hmm. I think she believed that he truly was going to be the savior mm -hmm. or was going to be the rescuer mm -hmm. of her people. But do you think she, when this happened, do you think she thought that this was the way it was going to happen? Oh, no, no. I don't think she thought this was how it was going to happen mm -hmm. at all. I think probably the day he killed the slave, I think that was probably <laughs> one of her lowest days. That would have been one of my lowest days. Right. That would have been the day that I would have struggled the most because... Now he's on the run. He's having to run from Pharaoh, from the very people who've trained him how to be this great person. And she has no idea where he's going. He didn't come back to them. You know, I mean, he's on the run. run. They have no That's idea right. where he's at. Mm -hmm. So then I got to thinking, wow, I mean, how do you go for 40 years? The person that you believe was going to be the savior of your people, you have no contact with for 40 years. Mm -hmm. How do you keep faith during that time? And how do you... You know, how do you keep strong and keep believing? Obviously, she had to because when Moses comes back, she's there. That's right. Yeah. You know, by the time he comes back, she's, what, 80 years old, mm -hmm. 90 years old, somewhere thereabout? 
The Bible doesn't say anywhere that she hesitated to receive him as the, as the rescuer of the people. But it was her brother, too. So you got to right. think, when you see a family member you ain't seen in a long time, what's the first thing you so do? So how much of it was faith and how much of it was my, my brother, you know, the, the one that I right. took to the water right. and saved, saved, you know. How much of it was internalized and how much of it was, you know, just... Was just, you know, great. But, um, <clears throat> so then it says... What does Miriam feel as she sees God confirm their messages by great miracles, one plague after another, for at least six months? Doesn't really say. I tried to get the timeline just down, but it, it it's probably at least a six-month period, maybe a little longer. But when Moses comes back and all these plagues are being, you know, given to the people, what do you think she's feeling at that point? Because, you know, he's back now after 40 years. He's, he's back to save them. She's believing in him. Moses is speaking You reckon to Aaron. she was doubting God? I wonder. Because she was already, she'd already got that and then turned around and all and this she, stuff And she's thinking, am I going to be a part of it yeah. or right. am I just going to be kicked to the curb? You know, because women didn't have a whole lot of say. Same. No, they didn't. And so she would only be a part if God appointed, appointed her, her. to right. be a part. So I have to wonder, you know, did she stay faithful to God during all this time and keep believing and, you know, and keep trusting, um, you know, that he was going to rescue them and that he was, you know, going to have this huge part. Be, I don't think she had any idea how huge of a part she was going to have. Going on, all the plagues going on, that would be hard to tr trust that you are going to be saved. Like, yeah. Yeah, it would. And it's just like, like Yeah. And even after they left, you know, when the chariots came after them and they're, mm -hmm. they're on the run and, and they get to the Red Sea, it wasn't until the Red Sea like that you really <laughs> get this revelation of how strong of a relationship Miriam's had with God. Amen. Because when she sings, leads the women in that song with the tambourine and dance at the Red Sea, mm -hmm. There was nothing me, me, me about it. No, it was wasn't. all praise. It was all pure, honest praise. And she led the women in a song and dance to praise God for deliverance. And one thing I noticed in that, let's, let's turn to where, let's see, where is that? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I thought I wrote the verse down. All right, Exodus 15, 1. Through one and two. Stacey, will you read that? <clears throat> I 15. can't get my eyes to focus on the Bible this morning. One and two. Uh-huh. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang the song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I'll sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. All right, so that's the song that Moses teaches the people. All right, now, Stacey, read on to where Miriam brings the tambourines out with the women. Just keep reading? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it starts around three. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew <laughs> with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who right, hold on one second. Do y'all notice anything in this, how do, how Moses is pointing out every single thing that God did? Mm -hmm. He's not just saying, thank you for your blessings. How many no. times do we do that? How many times do we just say, 
Thank you, Lord, for your blessings today. We need to call those blessings out specifically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we ever say, thank you, God, for three meals in my belly today? Or thank you, Lord, that I was able to get up out of the bed today. You know, thank God for the things that he truly does give us. Moses is teaching us that in this word, that, that it's important to God. Right. It's important that we call out everything that we're thankful for, that we don't just <clears throat> give it a blanket of thankfulness, but that we point out, that we call it to his attention, to his mind, every single thing that we're thankful for. And that's hard for us to do, I think, in this day and time. Because we get so busy and we just we just take so many things for granted that it's hard for us to really grasp the importance that God is telling us in in His Word with this. That hey, I want to know what you're thankful for. I want to know that you're thankful for this and this and this. Even not though He already knows, He likes just to hear it from us. <clears throat> right? I think, yeah. 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 He wants us to acknowledge Knowledge. it. Knowledge. To know that we know what. What we've been blessed with, I think, is more importantly than, than anything. Okay, Stace, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You, in your mercy, have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the in inhabitants of Philistine. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as a stone. Till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased. You will bring them... In and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. That's good. You can stop right there. All right. So <clears throat> we're, we're learning in through this that it's so important for us to tell God what we're thankful for and to bring it, you know, to our attentions. And then... Is it? It's verse 20. twenty. Is, I was going to say, is it verse twenty where she starts with the song and dance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Read it's just the twenty and twenty-one. Read those two. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, "Sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed great gloriously. The horse and its rider He has thrown into the sea." So there again, she's changed just a little bit of the wording as she brings the women out. But can y'all just close your eyes and just imagine all these women coming out with their tambourines, with their big earrings on, their fancy dresses, and they're out there in this mud <laughs> singing and dancing, praising God for saving them. Amen. And they're telling him exactly what they're thankful for. You know, they're not just out there just singing and hoopahing and beating their tambourines on their legs. They're actually singing a song that is, in essence, a prayer, a thank you. Um, you know, it, they're, they're out there just pouring their hearts out, giving it all they've got. How many of us can do that today? What, what's the first thing you would think of if you were asked, if <clears throat> somebody... Um, if, if we were, you know, just, we just got saved out here in the roadway or something and somebody starts playing a tambourine and to calling all the women, come on, come out, let's, let's thank God for saving us today. What, what would you them. do? I'd join them. I would too. I'd probably look at them. <laughs> Stacy would go, um, um, I don't think so. <laughs> Tammy, what would you do? If I just got saved, I'd probably be happy enough to join them too. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I mean, because if you yeah. think back to the day you got saved. I mean, I'm oh, I know. Too, that joy you had. the joy in your heart. You're overjoyed but, and excited. Oh, so just right. imagine the joy that these, these women have. That's right. It's just pure, unadulterated, just... It's unfiltered. Yeah. It's just complete joy. Just, I thought they felt like they were about to bust. They it? saw <laughs> these, <laughs> they saw these chariots and these horses and these men This this just come back down over them and drowned them. And they know that they're saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
You know, and I'm thinking, holy cow. I mean, how can you? She's, she plays such a huge part in that. But then, but then, in a two-year span from Egypt to the border of the Promised Land, what happened to change her? What happened that caused her to start this gossip train about her brother? That's did, where jealousy probably jealousy. comes. That's yeah. where jealousy come in at. Right did there. her position go to her head? Was it pride? Did she become impatient with Moses? You know, because Miriam was an action person. Right. You know, obviously, mm-hmm. she acted. She she just went with it. Moses waited on God. Mm-hmm. He waited on direction for God. He had patience. You know, he was a humble man. He waited patiently, humbly for God to give an answer. Miriam, let's do it. Let's do it. You know, did she get impatient with him? And did she think that as the older sister who saved him, who done all this stuff in his life ahead of time, did she think she needed to be equal to Moses? Or maybe even higher than Moses because she had done so much to save him. And did she feel like Aaron was being slighted because Aaron was the oldest brother? And normally the eldest brother Brother, was the one that got this job. So, and then you think about that, how much that sounds like us. That's what I just said. How many times have we seen a brother or a sister get something in Christ and grow and get elevated in essence? And us think, well, that good, man, I've been here working three years longer than they have. What the crap have I got for it? You know? I've been working just as hard as they have. I don't. Why? Why ain't I getting praise like that? And I wonder if that's what happened to Miriam. Is that is that what really started this? Was it really about the wife? I, I don't think it is. I think it's a hidden thing because you know, with gossip, there's always a hidden thing. Have you ever or have you ever noticed that there's always a hidden agenda? Or when you get upset with somebody, or sometimes you'll put out something that's <laughs> little and stupid. It don't even make no sense uh-huh. why you even got so big. And that ain't even about. what you're been. And that, yeah, about. but that's all you want people to know about is that little bit, not about the big part mm-hmm. of the story. Mm-hmm. That's true. And because usually the bigger part of the story, mm-hmm. it involves you, and, and it's embarrassing to you yeah. as a yeah. person too. And you yeah. don't want nobody else to know. Like maybe you're the root of the problem. problem. That's right. That's right. And so you know, I got to thinking about Miriam is really like all of us. Mm-hmm. She was she she really is. She's God is saying to us through her, "This is my people today." Yes, it's in the Old Testament. But so what? It still applies. I, I'm, I believe that from beginning to, to end, end applies to this lives. applies to our life today. Some people want to say that the Old Testament doesn't matter. It's just the New <laughs> Testament that matters. But I beg to differ. If it didn't matter, why would God wanted it put in here? Why would it have been so important that he put these facts in place for us to read and to study? Why put all this information about Miriam if she wasn't important? That's right. Why not just say, you know... You know, he was he was taken down to the water, and he Pharaoh's sent for a wet nurse. And why, why mention who did all the footwork? Right. You know, why mention that Miriam was the one who led these women in song and dance? I think it was to show us that God will give us the importance that He thinks we deserve and can handle mm-hmm. to do the job that He has for us. But none of us are without defiance none of us are without the ability to get haughty Mm -hmm. you know Miriam had she didn't have a beautiful home a fancy car she had to go out and gather her her own food just like all the other ladies in the camp did Mm -hmm. she had to wait for God God to provide water for them when they wanted water to for the manna to fall to go out and collect it. She Mm -hmm. had no special treatment. She still had to do just like they did. Do you have to have special treatment just to serve God though? I was fixing to say, but there Mm -hmm. again, should we expect that? You know, so Mm -hmm. many people expect that when they get saved, their life is just going to change for the good. Nothing bad's ever going to happen to them again. Because a lot of preachers teach that. That's yeah. right. They teach the good, and we're still going to go through life. That's right. We still live out here in this world. That's that don't right. mean that we ain't got God, Jesus, to walk with us through it and to help lead us. But mm-hmm. 
You know, we're so blessed here at Mount Creek because we do have a pastor that is very real, is very honest, and he tells us every Sunday, week after week, you know, look, your life is not going to be perfect. Quit quit thinking that it is because it's not. You're going to get disappointed. When I read my Daily Bread the other day, it said, why take only God's good but not as bad? It's talking about in Job. Uh-huh. If you only got God's good, then you would never know bad. I mean, I know we'd all love, right. think that we would just love never to have bad. But, what if, <laughs> but some, then, Why would we need God if we you, only had the good? That's what I was supposed to say. Your faith. Like, there it, would be no point of needing that faith. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why, I mean, when I read that, I was like, wow. And I put amen, amen, and we joke him. I was like, did you read today's Daily Bread? He's like, it was a good word. What? I was like, yeah, it was a really good word. <laughs> But you know, we, we, we often forget this part of Mary. That's right. We often forget that she was just a woman. Mm-hmm. Just a woman that God loved. He thought her as a gift. That's right. You know, he thought her as a precious gift to his people because he put her in a high place. Mm-hmm. He allowed her to be in a place of leadership. But at some point in time, like we often do, she let that leadership go to her head yeah. She forgot the real reasons why she was there. And, you know, in Numbers 12, 1 is where it's talking about the the Cushite wife. Tammy, will you read that, please, ma'am? Sure. Do you say Exodus 12, 1? Uh, uh, numbers. Oh. Numbers 12, 1. Moses would have probably been about 82, 84, somewhere along in there. Well, they were at Hazaroth, Marion. And Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. All right. Now, some look at that I'm and say... Ethiopian. Ethiopian. Some look at that and say, okay, he married her that day. And this is where the true reason of, you know, he's above us. And they can't bring that out because then that's going to be petty. So they bring out this issue with the wife. Mm-hmm. So some people think that maybe he just married the woman that day and they're coming out against him. Because why would she have held her tongue all this time about the Cushite wife if she had been a part of it all the way up to there? Now I couldn't find anything one way or the other that that led me to certainty because a lot of people believe that that is talking about Zephora. Which he married 40-something years earlier. But that's what I got out of it, too. That's why I asked at the beginning. And so, that's what it right. like. and so there's a lot of back and forth about that. And, I mean, I had pages and pages. I, I Googled it. I, I went on uh, Bible.com. I, I went to, I pulled out every one of the Bibles I had. I looked up concor- in the concordance and tried to run back and forth over the different things, trying to match, you know, the different things. And you're going to find mixed statements from both. Some that think it was two wives, some think that it was just Zephora, Mm -hmm. and it was just that Miriam just now brings it out. But there again, I don't think it matters. I don't think it was important or God would have made sure that he would have had a woman's name there. Right. It wouldn't have just said Cushite or Ethiopian woman. Moss is a foreign woman, a Kushna, and it was true that, in, and then it says in parentheses, he did indeed marry such an African. That's all it says. So it leads you to believe that it was a black well, skinned female. Or median, that. Could be either or. Well, and, and then when I looked at, there was um, trying to make the connection between Midianites and Kushites is like a huge jump. Yeah. I mean, it's like. One is a pale skin and one is a dark skin. skin. But clearly, I'm going to show in a minute, I think, I believe it was a dark skinned woman. And I'll show you why. I think that plays a large part in leprosy. Because what happens when you become a leper? You get ash white. white. That's right. As white as white can be. That makes sense. So, if you're first, if, you, if you're. Making a prejudice statement, a prejudice gossipy statement about right. a black skinned man that my man of God, my, my man has married. Right. Then let me show you what white is. You see what I'm saying? You right. see how I made that correlation? Right, right, right. right. That's kind of where, um, kind of where I thought about that. You know, um, 
because I was thinking, okay, God, why leprosy? That seems so harsh. But then when I got to pulling all the pieces together, there's a couple of things. One, what was Miriam's most loved thing about people? She loved being around people. Mm -hmm. what, what, what did she love to do? How did she love to interact with those people? Dance. Dance, dance and song. song. She, that yeah. closeness, okay? That, that relationship. She wasn't up here and the people down here. She did what they did. She went down here. She interacted with them. She became a <clears throat> part of them. Mm -hmm. Well, if she had leprosy, she, she had to could, be sent outside the camp. That's right. She could have no contact. Okay. None. As a matter of fact, she would have to declare herself unclean when anybody got within hearing distance. Yeah, that's she would like, have to cover her mouth and holler, unclean, unclean, unclean. That's like the lepers. So that they could go away. The story of the lepers. So, by giving her leprosy, okay, one, she is white as white can be. You've spoken out against a person of color. You've spoken out against a person of mm -hmm. a different ascent, descent than you are. Mm -hmm. So, let's make you what you say you are. Okay? Mm. We'll make you white. Then, she's struck with leprosy and has to be sent out mm -hmm. to be away from the very Great people she's she loved. loved. She can't be anywhere inside the encampment. She can't have any physical contact whatsoever with, in, with another human being. Wow. So mm -hmm. I believe that, that with the leprosy, God was, was teaching us two things. <laughs> One, you know, is that he is in authority. <laughs> I am the person in authority. I will make the decisions. I will lead. I will guide. I will instruct. I will hand out the punishment when I see it needs to be handed out. And two, yeah. I believe that, you know, he is also showing us that whatever I do, I do for a reason. That's right. And that's hard for us to understand, especially with all y'all are going through right now. It's mm -hmm. hard to understand the reasoning that God has for that. But our mm -hmm. eyes can't see what his eyes can see. Mm -hmm. We don't know the future. We don't know tomorrow. We do, our hands and feet All we know is move. he knows best for us. Even though we, don't, right. we still don't see, understand it all. But that's we do right. know he's in control and there's a reason for what he does. That's right. And we don't understand and we probably won't never understand. That's but that's right. okay because. But you have the assurance. That if, if he done something... He could have just done it for the better of us. I mean, he did it for the better of us, even though we don't see that. I mean, right, yeah. It's right so now, easy to get angry and mm -hmm. discouraged and ask why, why, why. But on the same hand, he's still in control. Yeah. No matter how many times we ask or what we think or right. whatever else, he knows. And he knows. Just like she struck, struck, struck with leprosy mm -hmm. and, and Moses is pleading for her. Mm -hmm. And in seven days, God does heal her and bring her back into the camp. Ain't that how, how so Moses, how did Moses stand up and after she done spoke against him like she did and Moses still stood up and was he like, was a humble man. I'm still stand up right beside you and, and beg <coughs> your, <coughs> your case in front of God. And, and seven, seven, the number of perfection. Perfection. Com yeah. Completion, yeah. right? Completion, yeah. yeah. And why didn't Moses, I mean, why didn't Aaron get attacked? Anybody know? Mm -mm. Because he immediately, when he saw what happened to her, he immediately repented of his sins yeah. and asked for forgiveness. He said mm. in verse 11, <clears throat> Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, please do not lay the sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Mm -hmm. mm. So he immediately he repented, felt, accepted felt, felt. Moses as being the true leader. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's Lord in a lowercase, not an uppercase yes. Lord. But he immediately recognizes that his brother is at a higher place with God than what they are. They are. And he, he recognizes that authority mm -hmm. and, and repents of his sins. And, and that's why Aaron, there's also the possibility that Moses, uh, that Miriam was the one who started the gossip. Therefore she was the one yeah, but who received the Whether you punishment. started it or if he was involved in it, you're just as guilty. That's, that's what I was fixing If you to go say. out and commit a crime and you're with somebody that's committing that crime, you're just as guilty. That's it's right. the same thing, I believe, with God. And it's, you know? it's just like if we don't repent like mm -hmm. Aaron did, then we're going to receive the same punishment. punishment. You know, that we have a consequence for everything that we do. Mm -hmm. um, can, Wendy, can you find James 3? James 3. 5 and 6. And Stacy, will you find James 3, 9 and 10? 
I want us to talk a little bit more about gossip just because I really believe that that's what God is pulling out of this with Miriam to us is that, number one, she went against the authority of God. And number two, by doing that, you know, she rebelled against God directly. But number two, that it all started because of her gossiping. James what? Um, three, five, and six. Because she had anger about something else, which was about the authority Moses had over them. That's how all of this started. Not about the Cushite wife. Right. Not about her. Right. Had nothing really to do with her. It all started because of the authority that she felt like Moses was taking over them. Read James 3, 5, and 6. Okay. It says, just the same with our tongues. It's a small muscle capable of marvelous and undertakings. And do you know how many... Forest fires begin with a single ember from a small campfire. The tongue is a blazing fire seeking to ignite an entire world of vices. The tongue is unique among all parts of the body because it is capable of corrupting the whole body. If that were not enough, it ignites and consumes the course of creation with a fuel that originates in hell itself. Whoa. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, have you ever? I, I, I had never read that verse. I can honestly say I had never mm. read that verse before. It ain't never stuck out to me like that. Really, I'm sure I read. I've never really... But when I was studying this, that that's why I feel like that's really what God wants us to learn about Miriam is it's about the gossip. It's about how, it, how much gossip in our lives can break our relationship with Christ, break us down, ruin our relationship, tear us apart, tears our, our churches, our families, our friendships. Um, you know, Tammy and I, have experienced that directly with each other. And, and it, as a matter of fact, it was a year ago, a year, year ago this month. And, you know, I think <clears throat> that in going through that, I, I hope that I have learned and that I have a better understanding that the things that we say, regardless of the intention behind them, mm -hmm. If we, if we say them without asking God what he wants us to say first, we can try to handle a situation, and that's exactly what I did. I tried to defend myself because I felt like I was being attacked, and I tried to, um, I tried to, I tried to prove that I had been a good person. Mm -hmm. You know, I tried to prove that that I didn't deserve what was happening to me, that I wasn't the one who had done wrong. And in doing that, <clears throat> this whole train of gossip started and this whole line of BS, forgive me, started. And, and it almost destroyed me and a person that I cared very, very deeply about. And we are to this day still repairing and rebuilding and, and mending f fences. But I do think that both of our tongues are a little less quick to rattle and a let little less quick to respond when, when we're asked a question. And I think that we both have learned to, to ask God, okay, God, how, how do you want me to handle this? What do you want me to do in this situation? Because I went at it as, okay, I'm being attacked, so I'm going to... The first thing is to go back yeah, at it. Because I'm going to bite back. first. Yeah, lash back, because yeah. I'm, i i got to say, I'm guilty of that a lot of times. As soon as and I've it. had to learn, Moses didn't fight his battle. Who fought it for him? God. God. <laughs> if I'll sit back, if I'll sit back like Moses did, if I'll sit back and bite my tongue... And hold my peace. God will take care of what mm -hmm. He needs fixing. And usually, He don't need my help. No, and he usually, don't. if we try to <clears throat> fix it ourselves, we make a mess of it. it <laughs> yes, worse. we do. It gets way worse than. <laughs> yes, it does. When Y'all really just need to sit back and just be like, okay, God, you know, I I can't do this. I can't handle this situation. Like yeah, it's, you just got to give it over to Him. But then the waiting process. And it took us. Four months to give it, four or five months to actually give it over to God and say, okay, 
We've, we've royally screwed this up. Now, now what? You know, after we made a mess of it, ruined um, a lot of relationships, um, we had to step back. Trust, trust. faith, love, mm -hmm. peace, harmony. I mean... Um, and trust is a big thing to get, get It by. is. Yeah. Well, so people are okay. so quick to remember our past mm -hmm. and to point out our faults. But I'm here to tell you, when you're pointing... That's going back at you, you most know, of the time. A lot of times. You better be careful. And I've had to learn that the hard way because I I, I had I had faults that I had to admit to. I, I had done wrong in a, in that situation and I had to admit to it and I had to ask God to forgive me. And y'all remember I was preparing for a missions trip mm -hmm. <clears throat> this time last year as well, just like mm -hmm. I am this year. Mm -hmm. So I I was I almost backed out of the mission trip because I felt like I was going to go and be a hindrance because there was such strife there. And I really had to ask God, please, Lord, you've got to give me direction. You've got to, you have got to change this. And we spoke a couple of times when I was on the trip. We, we started repairing stuff before I left. So it was about a month, almost a month. We didn't speak at all. But then we started repairing things and started working toward trying to repair it. Unfortunately, we're both still trying to repair some relationships and, and some trust issues with, with different people. But <clears throat> all that stems because I reacted without asking for God to lead me to react. I think we all do. I reacted out of human. hurt, out of anger, out of fear. Because I didn't trust God the way Moses trusted God. And I know this lesson is about Miriam, so I'm not trying to make it all about Moses. But I want <laughs> to show that Miriam started this gossip venture mm -hmm. that Moses had to sit through. He had to endure. Mm -hmm. He had to sit there and keep his mouth shut. And God swooped down. And fought this battle for him. And he will do that for us ladies. If we will just let him. If we'll just sit back. Keep our mouths shut. Don't spread gossip. Don't don't get on this train of. of you know. Of repeating stuff. And, and it's so. You do it sometimes. You don't even realize you've done it. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you. If you ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. I've, I've really been praying about that. And I get this. Mm, like a kick in my gut when I've done it. And I immediately, God, please forgive me for what I just did. And ask him to repair it, to fix it, to stop it. Whatever the situation may be. Because it's so important. It, it can take a lot. It can cause a person to get out of fellowship with Christ. Mm -hmm. It can cause souls to be lost forever and go to live in a fiery hell. I mean, come on. Do we want to be responsible? Do we want this? To be responsible for it's like That's having it's like our having, body. It's like having the blood on your hands. You might as well just went out there and killed them yourself. It's I know. The same thing. It is. It's it is. We need. It's exactly the same thing. Same thing. And That's this tongue can just wag so quickly if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. um, Stace, read um, three, nine, and ten. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in this similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. All right. So it can be used as a blessing or a cursing. Mm -hmm. So the decision is ours how we use this tongue. We really have to be careful that we don't let Satan use us like he used Miriam. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that God's going to strike us with leprosy. I'm not saying that he's going to cause some horrible something to happen in our life. But do we know for... But I do shirts? know. <laughs> I do know from experience that God will get your attention. Mm -hmm. If you go against one of his... And I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about just people in the church. I'm saying we shouldn't talk about anybody. We shouldn't gossip about anybody. Yeah. But we dadgum better not be talking about God's people. You know, I just said the same thing to TJ a couple months back. Something, something had come out, and I'm not even going to bring all that up, but it, something come up, and I said, you know, I'm not going to do nothing. I'm just going to sit back and let it play out because I feel like you don't mess with God's people. I'm sure you don't mess with no people. Don't right. get me wrong when I say that. But if you're God's people, 
you sure don't want. Well, I think there's evidence of that I mean, there's evidence of, evidence of it now. That's kind of yeah. crazy. Like, this was like six months ago when me and TJ was talking about this. And here it is yeah. six months there, here's, later. Here's and evidence. There's evidence of it right there. Yeah, and, and you know, like I said, from beginning to end, this is God's word. This That's is right. our instruction book. This is how we're supposed to live our life. So if God thought it was important enough to bring out this gossiping issue that Miriam had, mm -hmm. then I think it's important enough for us to learn from these two verses in <laughs> James 3 <laughs> how powerful our tongue can be, both good and bad. You were just saying about how a lot of people think just the New Testament is, goes with today, but it just went hand in hand with I was fixing the to say Old Testament. Testament. That's right. <laughs> Amen. I was, I was just fixing to say that, Stacey. I'm so glad you brought that out. You know, we, we're reading verses out of the Old, and we're reading verses out of the New, and, and they're the doing same. this. Yeah. It's, it's still, still the same, the same like word. Parallel to the, That's right. The words may change a little, but right. the, but the meaning, meaning is the same. Is exactly the same. <laughs> and there's no question about no, it, there right? Isn't. There's no, no, question, no question whatsoever uh -uh. that it, it is the same. So two problems that I see with Miriam is that she rebelled against authority, mm -hmm. which was a direct rebellion against God. Mm -hmm. And then the second was she let that tongue wag, and she let it wag for the wrong reason. And in doing that, she, you know, she caused herself some great harm. Well, she got leprosy Ladies, and it ended up killing her. I mean. We do that. We cause ourselves the harm. When we do that, when we gossip, when we spread a rumor, when we, when we do something, for instance, there was, an, there was a situation where a man and a woman was seen in a grocery store. The man's wife was at home sick. The woman is trying to help him. He's trying to find soup, but his wife's on a strict diet, so she, he's having to read all the labels, and his eyesight's not real good, so she's trying to help him. So they're standing in a close approximation of each other. She's trying to help him read these labels. Another, you know, church member comes around, sees the two of them standing there closely, you know, looking at these labels with their carts, oh, puts gosh. on her shades, pulls her hat down, and tries to get as close as she can to overhear the conversations that they're having, and then presumes to make her own judgment about what's taking place. How many times has that scenario played out? It's ridiculous. Then she goes back and she says, you ain't going to believe what I saw the pastor's son with today. Did, did you know I saw the pastor's son-in-law talking to so-and-so in the grocery store? Did you see? You should have seen what she had on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Lord, people could talk about my husband all the time. Do y'all? I mean. I do see that. We <laughs> see that all the time. But it was so innocent. It, and it was perfectly innocent. Yeah. There was nothing wrong with it. But, unfortunately, the woman who's being talked about put herself in that position because we as ladies need to make ourselves aware of our surroundings. We need to make ourselves aware of the people who are around us and, and the situations that we're putting ourselves in. Had she been a little more noticeable and noticed that this other person was there, maybe she could have spoke to her and said, hey, do you know, you know his wife is sick, sick and blah, blah, she has blah. to have low That's sodium, right. you know, whatever. Do you know of a soup that would be good for her? Whatever. But sometimes we get so caught up. We don't up. think about it. And but like, we have to think yeah. about it. But do you know what assuming means? That's right. Absolutely. We have to think about that, ladies. We have to think <laughs> about the places we're seeing. We have to think about the people we're seen with. We have to think about our dress. And I'm not trying to harp on, on our dress. But I'm sorry, when we come into church and we got all this showing, our dress, what if we're our dress a, is up to your What if we're a distraction you know to some man who God is dealing with, but all he can see is all this? Or what if we come in with the top, you know, with the dress that's cut down, you know, it's up to our, our hips, and we bend over and we become a distraction? To a man who is dealing with pornography. Well, then you just made that person fall, and that goes back. The word says it somewhere. I don't know exactly where, but it talks about that. Not to let you don't help your other brother fall because it will be on That's you. That's right. You know, That's it right. does say that. I think it's in Proverbs. You know, Proverbs I, sure. I believe that when we come to church, we should wear our best, but we should come 
you know, I, I don't I don't think we have to come in here with our Sunday suits on and our hats and our gloves and all that because I don't think God cares about all that. Okay, my blue jeans I believe Sunday. if we come in here and we've got on blue jeans that are that fit us decently, that you know, excuse me, Lord, don't show the camel toe. <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. I'm so Facebook. Oh, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm serious, y'all. About my blue jeans. That's how gossip gets started, though, because then somebody says something Don't about <laughs> somebody says something about the way you're dressed, and you've started, you've caused somebody else to fail. So let's just oh, be, as long as we're be being cautious. modest about our dressing, I, I don't think God cares how we come to church. No, I, don't I don't think he cares if it's a blue dress or a red dress or a, a purple, purple dress. dress. But as long as you're being modest in right. not showing your body, I mean. Right, right, absolutely. It, it's like this right here. You know, back in the day, I used to dress not appropriate at all. <laughs> I mean, I ain't gonna lie, but. I can't imagine you dressing that way. I really can't. Oh, my. <laughs> Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> I don't dress like that. And I mean, God dealt with me at the beginning. I mean, I don't really want this on Facebook, but I didn't wear a bra. I wore short shorts. You might as well just let it all hang out. I didn't wear nothing. You know what I mean? Because that and, was kind of how your life was. But at that time. it didn't matter to me at that time. People mm -hmm. say, oh, yeah, I don't care what you think. And that's right. how it was. But God dealt with me at the very beginning with that and my music. That was the two things that God dealt with me about. But see, he had to get you to a place to where he could deal with you. Right. That. So if you come in and and you come in, you're coming into Christ, mm -hmm. you know, you may not think there's an issue with yeah, what you I have. Yeah, because I really do. And it's not my place to, to question it. So therefore, it's not my place to gossip <laughs> about it. That's right. Let God deal with it. Problem, if there's a problem and God sees there's a problem, let him do his job. Right. Let him he do don't, his job. He ain't hiring. He don't need us. <laughs> That's good. That's, That's the good. truth. That's God the ain't truth. Hard. He ain't hard. I mean, he don't need our help to point out everybody's flaws. Hey, really? And, I mean, and that's that's where we don't judge because, like you were saying, some some person might walk in to church that's, right. that's never seen the face of a church and they've been invited. Did you see what she was wearing? I know. And and that person and, may not ever come back again. And that's of right. That. And we might be the only Jesus that that person ever sees. That's the truth. I mean, and then if they walk into a church and we say, oh, my gosh, like. Why or if we there? stand away from them. Yeah. You know, do you know that our eyes tell a story they of sure how do. we feel about a person the first sure time does. we meet them? Oh, sure yeah, does. when you look at them, you go. When you, when you, you, when you see out. somebody come in and the first thing you do is you blink your eyes or or you turn away. They automatically assume, think that that's that. Whether I mean, that's show, the case yeah, or not. I have to but, watch my eyebrows. But most of the time we do. Eyebrows. We do. So do, we do. Like that. And then we have it, to be careful it, with that. It may completely turn that person away from Christ because they sit and they say, okay, well, these Christians. Uh huh. They, they're better than me. Sit they're there they're, and mm -hmm. say, I can't believe that that person's mm -hmm. wearing what and they're see, wearing. I think that's where Miriam was at. I, I, I think when she made the statement mm -hmm. about the Kushite woman, Kushanite, Kushanite, Kushite, Kushite, Kushite woman. I think when she when she started making the statement about it, you know, it doesn't say, but maybe she was. <laughs> maybe she maybe was <laughs> disappointed because of the color of her skin. Maybe she didn't like the way she dressed. Maybe she didn't like the way she talked. Maybe she didn't like the, you know, maybe she was a very strikingly beautiful a woman, woman and be. she was jealous of that. Have we ever felt that before? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you yeah. Know? When you see so, somebody real beautiful, you're like, oh, well, look at her. I and know. Skinny, oh. too, she's yeah. And all that. Yeah. And in all reality, it might be the nicest person you ever met. Or really this this is my, this is my problem. Right? Yeah. A lot of times I'll look at and God, I've asked God to forgive me of this and to help me with this. But a lot of times I've looked at skinny people who I feel like have never had to struggle with their weight like I have. I mean, because I can look at a candy bar and gain five pounds. Right. And I'm not kidding when I say that. But a lot of times when I look at, you know, when I look at women and I just think, oh, God, look how lucky she is. She can go to the store and buy anything she wants to. 
But I don't know what she's struggling with. That's right. Maybe she's maybe she's so skinny because she struggles with insecurity about herself to the point to where she can't eat. Or sickness maybe. not to gain, be or able to gain maybe. weight. Maybe she takes medicine. My ex-sister-in-law has took all the protein drinks and everything you could think of because she wanted to gain weight. And she was always been little mm -hmm. bitty and... Bless her heart, but she still ain't gained weight, even though she tried all the medications and all we the different things. We never know what that person is struggling with. Maybe they're yeah. struggling with an eating disorder. That's right. That's right. And maybe but they were. This can change a life in a New York minute, and we have saw that it's it's been proven yes. by God's own words <laughs> that it can it can change. Proverbs twenty one twenty three says, "Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut, and you will stay out of trouble." <laughs> Amen, Amen, sister. sister. <laughs> We've learned that, and we've learned that. It needs to be a verse you learn from. So, um, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Um, and Tammy will be teaching next week. Not um, <laughs> yes, please, so I can watch it. Um, she's not sure what she's she's what God's leading her toward yet. So you'll let us know what study. One way or the other. Sure. You know, Tammy's the, re be a Tammy's the rebellious one. She's probably going to teach about a man. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I know that whatever God, whatever word God puts in her heart, I know she'll do a great job, and I'm excited to hear it. So, even if it's not on Facebook, she will record it for her sister to be able to hear. I don't like people listening to me. So, well, I don't necessarily like it either, but. <laughs> Um, I, I think, I hope that the people who do get to watch it get something out of it. And, you know, everybody's not able to come here and meet in, in our building at the time we can meet. So I'm hoping that it does help people to learn and to study and I'm um, leaning towards second to gain some insight. So, um, so That's Second cool. Timothy is what you're leaning toward. Well, send it's us a text message and let us know. Encouragement in difficult times for Christians. Oh, that'd be good. Um... So I hope y'all enjoyed the study on Miriam today, and I hope you got some insight, and I hope that you learned something that you hadn't learned before. I hope that you got something <laughs> out of it that was different. I know I definitely didn't expect for a message on Miriam to be about gossip when I started this. I was like, you know, I, I couldn't believe it when God started just pouring those verses out to me and just really started pouring in um, because like I said, I thought it was going to be, you know, about her life and death, you know, type thing and what she did in between. But it, it um, brought out a lot more, didn't it? Yeah, it did. <laughs> it most definitely did. And uh, I just thank God for that. So um, anyways, um, for those of you who are watching, we thank you very much. And we'll see you next time. Ciao.